Good morning. Last Sunday, yesterday, I spent time with Dr. Jody Ray, pastor of Mount Bethel Church in Marietta, Georgia. And he uh, preached a, a powerful sermon. And so I want to build on that and spend time with you in l- dealing with the subject, living a spirit-filled life. What does it mean? How can you understand it clearly, what a spirit-filled life is? Having a life filled with the Holy Spirit, a spirit-filled life, a life filled with the Holy Spirit. Every believer that puts his trust on Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit in them. It's impossible to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and not accept Jesus. And so, Romans 8, 9 is my first scripture. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so the Holy Spirit is a powerful presence that not only energizes the Christian to fulfill his call in life, but he identifies you as being of Jesus. So the second question here is this. How do you know, how do you confirm that the Holy Spirit is in you? How do you know that? It is an interesting question. It is really two questions here in one. First, how do I know for sure that I have the Holy Spirit in me? How do I know for sure that I have the Holy Spirit in me? Then I will spend time on how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's a question. It is possible to be involved with God in many ways in terms of ministry and not be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is possible to be a servant of the Lord in church and committees and not be filled with the Holy Spirit. The same way when we think in terms of the two basic foundations of thinking in terms of development, we deal with justification and sanctification. Justification is if you didn't do it. The righteousness of God justifies you. Sanctification is a process that involves growth, involves movement, involves complete surrender and control in the presence of God, in your life, in your development. You know, we we call in the Methodist Church spiritual formation. But it is actually two processes. They're not together the same way. They have degrees of development, degrees of growth, degrees of involvement. And so, Ephesians 5.18 is another scripture. It says, And he, and be not drunk of the wine, wherein in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's a level of the presence of God in your life that is demonstrative. Look at verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks, meaning there is an expressive movement of peace and joy and singing and dancing and rejoicing, which not many Christians have. Some Christians have that freedom. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Some are more moderate. They're not expressive but they trust the Lord for their salvation 
and they are blessings of the kingdom of God. So there's a difference between spirit-filled people and people who have not been filled with the Holy Spirit. Am I doing okay so far? All right. So let's take a look at Acts 4.31. Here's a, a clear picture of a spirit-filled life. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke this word of God with boldness. Notice that boldness is demonstrative. Being filled with the Holy Spirit causes you to rejoice, to dance, to sing, and to be used of God. That's more than that. And I'll get to it in a minute. First Corinthians verse chapter two. First Corinthians. Chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. But a natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. The natural human being, unsaved, receives not the things of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So there's a clear picture between the saved and the unsaved. The unsaved, because of not being convicted by the Holy Spirit and professing Jesus as Lord, cannot discern the Scripture, cannot discern what God is doing, cannot discern what the Holy Spirit is saying, because there's no community, there's no, there's no relationship. Now, the one that is filled, with, but he who is spiritually judges all things. And so, the spiritually led person judges all things. Why, why you can, judge it simply means you are able to discern what's in front of you belonging to God and what's in front of you that is not of God. And so being saved, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. But the progressiveness of that experience with Jesus It's completely different. Amen? It's completely different. And so, the spirit to discern mind is led of the spirit. If you're not led of the spirit, you cannot discern. You cannot understand. You cannot perceive. You can only read the Bible. It's just not there. Why is that the case? Romans 8, 7 says, Paul says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subjected to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In other words, it's impossible. If you're not led of the Holy Spirit, if you're not led, your carnal mind cannot understand the things of God. So let's take a look. How then... We received the Holy Spirit. Well, it was a miracle. There's nothing I can say more than that. A miracle. To be convicted of God and to be chosen and, and come to Jesus by profession of faith and communion, be baptized, is a, is a, is a miracle. The wind blows where it listens, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes and where it, where it goes. And that is the way of the Spirit of God. You're born of the Spirit. You don't know. It is in the mind of the Holy Spirit to save those he wants to save and, and not save those he don't want to save. It's a gift of God. So as, as we begin to deal with this and begin to understand this powerful, powerful Subject, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I hope that you are part of this miracle. Second Corinthians chapter 4 says this, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts, Give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Meaning, it's a miracle. 
It's a light that comes out of heaven and it permeates the person that is receiving and suddenly the Holy Spirit begins to convict. There are three things the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin, con convict of righteousness, convict of judgment. Uh, John 16, 8, 9, and 10, and 11. Luke 18, 27 says, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. And so this experience in being filled with the Holy Spirit is progressiveness in Christian faith. What do you mean by progressiveness? You can know Jesus. You can understand Jesus. And if you pursue the work of the Holy Spirit, then it begins to operate in your life and be, in being demonstrative. Notice that the Holy Spirit is very lightful, very happy, very joyful, very, 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 very powerful. Amen. All right. So to have the Holy Spirit seals your soul. Salvation, that is a product of a new life with God. And as the prog progress of this experience and this relationship with God increases in time, increases in service, increases in sharing the gospel with others, people that go to mission trips are totally transformed. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Why? It's because you're exercising your faith and going to a foreign country, and as you go, you are filled. Because the Holy Spirit sees need greater than what you see. You might be on the side of the altar to where there are hundreds and hundreds in front of you. And because there are, the need is greater than your understanding, you automatically begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've seen men age 75, 80 coming to Brazil with me and suddenly they are totally, completely transformed by the power of God. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Amazing. Amazing. It happens every trip that I've been in and I've seen that hundreds and hundreds of times. Okay, at times. So the result of this glorious miracle is that the Spirit-filled life is full of the Spirit. The Spirit-filled life is full of the Spirit. One more time. The Spirit-filled life is full of the Spirit. What do you mean by that? When you are full of the Holy Spirit, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. But no man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the person, the third person of the Trinity who communicates with you and develops in you a faith that is growing and developing and creating and serving the Lord. What activates the Holy Spirit is what you do with it. What activates the Holy Spirit is what you do with it. If you use the Holy Spirit instead of the Holy Spirit using you, Nothing happens. You don't use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses you to do what needs to be done in front of you. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the individual existence of a conscious person that laughs, that rejoices, that sings, that dances, that has power, that heals, <coughs> delivers, empowers. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 3. No man can say that Jesus is Lord but, but the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. So the Lordship of Jesus is the seal that you are led, that you're convicted by the Holy Spirit. So revelation, leadership, anointing, power, blessings are only available by the Holy Spirit, as He operates in you, instead of you operating in Him, He does it all. 
You are simply a channel by which God uses you to minister to others. As, as we travel to different nations in the world, I seem, seem to notice that those who serve the Lord in doing what they need to be done in the life of the church and the community have sometimes no power, no development, no creativity. They're sincere, they're honest people, they're kind, they're gentle people, but there's no power. When the Holy Spirit comes in, everything changes. Let me read to you a verse of Scripture that has got to be one of the most empowering verses in the Bible. Jesus is telling the disciples not to leave Jerusalem, for they will be endued with power from on high. Don't leave Jerusalem. Right there in the temple, something is going to happen. And in verse 8, he says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That has to do with being filled, being renewed, being encouraged, being empowered. It's a progressive movement of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Oh, but when I was saved, when I was 12 years old, I got everything. No, no, you didn't get everything. It's too much for you to take at a period of 12 years old. It's just the beginning of a dance that will play on your ear for the rest of your life. In other words, the empowerment, the baptism, the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God processes and begins the period of sanctification that causes you to experience the presence of God in a way you never experienced before. Now, there's a characteristic that I have to mention here about this experience. And if you go into 1 Corinthians 12, 7, let me go to it because I don't, wanna, I don't want to miss a single word. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man for the profit of all. What does it mean? Paul says that the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given not for you to handle it, not for you to deal with it, not for you to take control of it, not for you to create something. What Paul is saying is that no one has ownership of the Holy Spirit. If one is a recipient of the Holy Spirit, it is for the profit of somebody else. Now, how about Galatians chapter 5? How about Galatians chapter 5? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, temperance. I guess there is no law. <coughs> How about that? These are the fruits of the Spirit. When the Spirit activates and does things in your life, it actually creates and gives fruits. So the question that remains is, where are is Paul in the understanding of 1 Corinthians 12 when he deals, for one is given the spirit of, by the spirit, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the same spirit, faith, gives a healing working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, interpretation in tongues. Where is that part of the spiritual development of the work of the Holy Spirit in you? 
Notice that fruits come out of something. If you consider Galatians 5 and disregard 1 Corinthians 12, you've got a spiritual, psychological problem to, de- to, de- to resolve. How can you say to me that the fruits are there, but there's no place in your life for the operation of the gifts? So people who are Christians, who deal with this, simply accept the fruits, but deny the, the gifts. That is why they're powerless. You don't have to have it, but you can't deny it. You don't have to have it, but you cannot deny it. Because when you deny that which God does and the Holy Spirit expresses, you're denying the, the, the reason why there's no fruits is because you don't understand the gifts. So let me explain. I'm going to follow the list that is before me. And the list that is before me begins with the word of wisdom. And then the word of knowledge. You say, where is the discernment? It's coming, but not here. The first group is word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. The second group is faith, working of miracles, and gifts of healing. The third group is prophecy, tongues, and interpretation. First of all, where does discerning of spirits come in? Just, it comes in just before tongues and interpretation, after, after prophecy. Why is that the case? Because prophecy here in, in, in discerning of spirits are two special gifts that consider, because nothing to do with the prophet here. This is nothing related to prophet. Prophecy here has to do with Ephesians, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, 85, building, comforting. That's what prophesying is here. There's no prophet here. Prophet comes in Ephesians 4. This, this understanding here has specifically to relate and to do with the work of the Holy Spirit in terms of edifying, building, comforting, Blessing the people of God, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, I've been telling people that a lot of people in the Methodist church serve the Lord. They are people of the best quality. They're so gifted and so talented and so blessed of the Lord. They serve the Lord year after year after year. They are people that give their time, their effort without charging anybody. And I tell you, it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to hear that. Now, I want to tell them they're prophesying. They're actually doing something that is powerful in the area of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there are a lot of fruits. But they don't know it. Nobody tells them. They cannot understand Nobody ever thought this way. And as you study the, the message of Paul in First and Second Corinthians, you come clear to this understanding that you have to recognize the Holy Spirit of God in your life before he blesses you. And so we have this idea that if we speak about the gifts, and if we say something about the gifts, we don't want to accept it. Well, if you don't accept the way the Holy Spirit does his job, You can't have the Holy Spirit. How can you have the Holy Spirit in your life when you deny the gifts and only talk about the fruits? Fruit comes out of something. The gifts is first. The revelation is first. The fruits of the Holy Spirit come out of the way the Holy Spirit activates and thus expresses himself in a powerful and majestic way. I started my ministry in Lake Charles, Louisiana, 60 years ago. And I was one of those hungry Christians who understood this, but I didn't know how to get it. I wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit more than anything else. Mainly because I denied it so much, so long, and my father kept on telling me that 
unless I'm anointed by the Holy Spirit, I have no ministry. It doesn't grow. It just keeps up with it. It just keeps on perking, 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 perking. And so I have a, I just, I just, I just, and I didn't have the teacher. Well, I did have the teacher, which is Tommy Tyson, Earl Tyson, Dr. Charles Bolin, so many of the saints of the early, early, early 50s. And so I tried to sort of come to, 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 to try it. And I remember, I went to this church in Louisiana, in Lake Charles. That's the first time I ever seen a crawfish in a little Pentecostal hands. And, of course, I began to suck the head and take the oil out. And the owner of the hotel told me, Sir, you eat just the little legs. Take the little black little lime and eat the little legs, but don't suck the oil. Yeah. Only the kunas do that. Right. <laughs> Only the kunas right. do that. And so <laughs> I cleaned my mouth and went to the bathroom. And <laughs> don't suck the head. Don't suck the head. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, I, and so that night I came to church. In the altar field, I sang three songs and preached ten minutes. And they just came up. In the altar, there were three people. And the way I got to them was that one of them was squeezing his own hand to a point of breaking his bones. And I saw the blood just striving, and he's just trying to. And so, I said, Lord, tell me about these three good old Methodists. And I heard the Lord say, they... Their wives have died 20 years ago, and they go visit the wives and talk to them and have a TV there and watch the news with the wives every single morning. They lit, they lit the cemetery stones by visiting their wives. And so I went to the three and said, I hear from the Lord that should not, you should not communi communicate with the dead. Let the dead be dead. It is an abomination to the Lord that you like to speak to the dead. I want to tell you a story. And I told the story of Saul trying to talk with the witch of Andor to reach Samuel. And what happened to them because Samuel said, tomorrow you're going to die. And he died the next day with all his family. And they communicated with the pastor after service that I was in witchcraft and I should not be preaching in that church. And of course, the preacher gave me $100 for gas and I drove all the way to Atlanta. But that night was the best night in ministry I've ever had in my whole life. It was the beginning of an understanding that what I said to those men was true. They, they conferred and confessed that they did that and then nothing wrong with that. And after I heard from them, I said, I heard from the Lord, and thank you very much. You bless my life. I'm about to go. And I left singing hallelujah and praising the Lord. I remember I opened the windows of this car. I don't know what kind of car it was, but it was a piece of junk. And I kept on driving home. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the glory. Revive me again. Revive me, O oh God. And, and what, all I experienced was that God revealed to me something for the first time. Now, let me ask you this. Are you filled with the Spirit of God? Lift your hands toward this TV and repeat after me. Hallelujah, Father. Father. I receive the Holy Spirit in me. I receive the Holy Spirit in me, Lord. By the power of your Spirit, God, I confess my sin. And I ask you to bless me, anoint me, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you tomorrow.